be the one to break it to you. But sex education of the past failed us. Because birds and bees, they don't fuck. Welcome to Birds and Bees Don't Fuck, a show where we learn exactly how bad our formative sex education, or lack thereof, really was. I'm your host, Arielle Zadok. I'm an intimacy coordinator and sexologist. My guest today checks both comedian and sexpert boxes and is an award-winning writer and comedian. Welcome to the show, Teresa Love. Thank you for having me. Yay, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm happy to be here. It's very cool. I love that you have you have both of these things. That's always very exciting for me when I have somebody that has like, oh no, you're in both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> you're a little freak like me. <laughs> I kind of feel like comedy and the sex world is the only place that accepts uh, freaks and lets us thrive. <laughs> right? Exactly. Like, let your freak flag fly. Right. Be weird. Be your beautiful, weird self. <laughs> we accept all of us. We're Because it's like the people who, like, were made fun of or, like, slut-shamed or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, there are all these different layers of, like, you're a loser. You're a slut. You're this. You're that. And we're over here, like okay, we're just going to be that then. (laughs) We will monetize that then. Thank you. And monetize it greatly, right? Once people people get over the shame, you're just like, oh, there's a lot of money in this industry and not other industries. That's very interesting. Yeah. 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 So wait, tell me about your journey and, and which came first for you, more the sexuality stuff or more of the comedy stuff? Interesting. Okay, so I guess this is my journey is where um, I moved to LA from Kansas and I really wanted to be this like famous screenwriter. So I went to film school. I got a master's degree at USC. And um, when I was there, I was kind of like always in the middle. Mm -hmm. Like um, I wasn't necessarily like mistreated or ignored, but I just wasn't like favored. And versus the people in the program who were favored, like they went on to be huge writing superstars. And so that was not my destiny. Mm. And so after I graduated, I worked in production for a bit. And then um, I was so poor. So I ended up just going into like a corporate job. And when I was at a corporate job, I just started writing and things like that. And then um, one of the things I wrote, I wrote an erotica series and it did well. And um, then I was kind of like, you know, maybe I should just try to do freelance writing and not even have have this corporate job as a backup. So I gave that up, pursued freelance writing. And then from there, one of the freelance gigs that I got was writing for Hustler Magazine. And that was about nine years ago. And so I've been writing for them ever since. And then, um, but as a freelancer, I always write at home. And so there's a certain point in my life where I was like, okay, I'm making a living as a writer, but I'm kind of lonely. Mm. And so I was like, well, I want to try something else. So I kind of like was like, I don't think I'm going to try screenwriting again, but I really always liked stand-up comedy. So I tried that. I got on stage and I was actually good at it. And so then I've been kind of doing both ever since. Wow. And so was comedy on your original writing journey? Did you want to be a comedy writer or is that just something that like developed over time as you were like, well, let's just try this other weird thing? So I really wanted to get into comedy and like they were just, the doors were not opening. Like for instance, I was an intern, before I went to film school, I was an intern at the Letterman show. Oh yeah. And there I felt, yeah, there I felt really, I'm dating myself, but I was like, yeah. but there I felt really ignored and I was just like, I'm not going to break in here. Mm-hmm. I just really felt like there's not a place for me at this place. And then when I was in film school and I was writing like comedy scripts and stuff, like the stuff that I pr- produced myself did fine. But when I try to get other people to get involved or something like that, it just like, no one was buying my stuff. Like mm-hmm. other people were getting opportunities that were paid. And then I just seemed like I was like just spending my own money trying to be seen. But like no one was like paying me. And so I was kind of like, well, comedy writing is not working for me. Mm. And so, um, yeah, it's just like now as a performer, now it's starting to happen more with my writing. But when I was just a writer, I just couldn't seem to break through. Yeah. And that is a common experience for a lot of stand-up comedians is that uh, they get the gigs once they're on that stage, right? But that's like not, that's not what every writer can do. Not every writer has the ability or the the wherewithal or the desire to be on a stage. But, you know, you see that transition often where there's, I mean, I just worked, I saw that you opened for Chris Estrada. Oh, right. Yeah, He's yeah. great. So when I was at Disney, uh, his show was one of the ones that I was overseeing. So mm. he was a great example of like somebody who came from stand up, 
wrote a show about his life and wound up selling that show. And I mean, it was, it was a great show. This fool was the name mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, yeah. It was actually supposed to be a punk ass bitch, okay. but <laughs> <laughs> we all wanted it. The entire studio studio wanted it. I don't know if I'm allowed to tell that's that story, funny. but I'm sure he has too. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, it's, that's a really, there are two, there are two triggering words in there that of course for like networks and stuff right. like that, like the, that I understand why it was a hard sell, but like, every single person was like, this name is so good. Uh, but this fool works too. Yeah. It was it's, a funny, it's a funny word. This yeah, fool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this will, And it's also like, um, you know, I don't know if what you were seeing was that it was a lot of men that were getting the opportunities or a lot of, um, non, non Asian or white or whatever. Like what, what was your experience there? Cause I feel like that's something, you know, we both work in production. Mm -hmm. We're both women in production. We're both not, I mean, I'm white ish. I don't know what the fuck I am. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a mix. So it's funny when I talk to, uh, POCs of any type, they're like, no, you're Brown. And if I talk to white people and they're like, no, you're white. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm just mean. yeah. <laughs> um, you know what's interesting? When I was younger and when I was still in that environment and like really desperate, I really believed that I was not getting opportunities because I was a woman and because of my race. And now that I'm away from it, I'm like, oh, I think it was a little bit of an excuse because mm. um, I have this funny story. I don't want to like name drop her, but it, ca it kind of have to to sure. make it make sense is that when I went to school, um, I was in a program and she, another Asian woman and she went on to be the showrunner of The Walking Dead. Wow. So for me, I was like, there's no excuse. I can't pretend it's yeah. because of whatever. We, we were in the same place at the same time and that's what she did and that's what I did. So I think people also have to kind of look into their own souls. Like what's your own personal accountability mm -hmm. of why I ended up where I ended up? And I think for me, it was like I wasn't really ready when I was there mm -hmm. because I was so easily influenced. Like for instance, um, when I was in film school, I wrote a script about uh, growing up Asian in Kansas, which is my own personal experience. And I had a teacher who was like, that will never sell. You shouldn't be writing about Asian people. You should writing about something more mainstream. And I listened to him. Mm. I kind of think that if I was like a stronger personality, I would have been just like, this is mine. Well, shut up, you know, but yeah. I wasn't. And so I kind of felt like I wasted a lot of time listening to people who didn't know um, – how to make me better. Yeah. And so that was also on me. I didn't have that like skill to be like, this guy's wasting my time versus now if I was like to go back in a program like that, no one could talk to me like that. And also now that I'm a little older, no one talks to me like that yeah. at all. And I don't even think it's about, um, the day and age that we're in, I almost think it's like, who are you as a person? And they kind of get that vibe of what mm. they can do to you and say to you. So I actually think it's just the personal accountability of just like, it just was me because yeah. I've actually literally have seen an Asian woman thrive in the same environment I was. So yeah. I, I think it's that. Yeah. And I do think to a degree, like that script would have been, I mean, shit, you could still write it. I don't know if you did or if you didn't, Oh yeah, but like yeah. that story, I do think, you know, just because you dated yourself, I think we're probably around the yeah, same okay, age. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I don't think that the world was even ready for those stories. Like they, it's like these people can't comprehend it, even though they're so fucking good. And eventually like we had to break, but it did take people being like, fuck you. I'm going to write my story anyway. And so it's like that balance of like, how, how much do you have in you to fight for that story? Because it is yes. exhausting. And I think that is something worth validating. But I also think it comes down to this is that, um, oh, so for instance, when I was growing up, um, my dad is a natural hater. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so you were trained for yeah, it. I was trained. Okay. <laughs> but so like, whatever I would say, like he, you know, what's interesting about my, my parents is that they were very supportive of intellectual pursuits. So, mm -hmm. so for instance, like some people, I hear stories that their parents would tell them like, you'll never be a doctor. You're never, Ugh, but mine's the opposite. Terrible. Mine was like, you can only be a doctor. Yeah, you can only yeah. be a lawyer. But everything else aside from that, they just couldn't comprehend. And so they'd always be like, no, don't do it. And yeah. they had a million reasons why. And so like, I was kind of always like, well, if I really want to do something, I either just do it on my own or I don't tell them or I push back. Mm. But when I really want to do something, I would do it. And all the other things that when they would say something negative and I'd quit, then I was like, well, I did quit. And so I kind of think it like look back on the other times too of like when I was younger and didn't fight for myself is that someone else did fight for themselves. And so yeah. I kind of think as an artist, you have to decide how bad do you want this? Yeah. And if you quit, you can't really blame other people because everyone will always be a hater, but you have to decide yeah. how much do I want this? And I kind of look at that with like every aspect of my life. Like there was this book that I love to read. Um, 
It was like Mark Manson's, uh, it was like the something art, like- The Subtle Art of Not Giving not a Fuck. Giving yeah, fuck, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that book. But one of the things he said was that like, if you really wanted it, you would do it. And if yeah. you don't, don't give a fuck about it. And I even think about that with like a, like fitness or something. Mm-hmm. If you really wanted to be fit, you could do it. Yeah. If you really wanted to get a certain job, you could do it. It's like, how bad do you want it? And so I now my new thing is if I really wanted it, I could have done it. Yeah. And there's these are all choices that we make. Yes. And, and we have to take accountability or account for um, different – privileges and different obstacles and access and things like that because the wanting it bad enough or like really choosing to go for something is going to look different for every individual based off of your circumstances. But again, we have so many examples of people that like have risen to the top despite every single thing pointing to there's no fucking way that they would do that. So it is, it's that balance of, you know, how bad do you want something? What are you willing to sacrifice? How dedicated are you? What are the things that are in your way? And what resources do you need to push those things out of the way? And if you're constantly getting rejected, there's a a balance. And I think uh, just something worth saying out loud that it's like, yes, you can be rejected because people are fucking assholes, but Mm -hmm. you could also be being rejected because it's not good enough yet. So what can you take from that rejection as opposed to just being like, I'm not going to take no for an answer. Right. It's like, well, what can I learn from that? No. Why is this a no? And do I agree with that? Or do I, or is it really like, no, I really don't think that there's value in this. No, other than this is not the right partnership for me. Mm -hmm. So it's like that balance. I think it's always a balance. It's always a balance of like pushing for it and, and going after it completely and wholeheartedly. If it's something that you really want to do and recognizing what are the things are that are in my way And am I going to let that stay in my way or am I going to get the resources that I need to move that out of the way or to learn and develop whatever this thing is in a better, stronger way so that I can get to that? Yes. Yeah. Because I think about this as like um, my best friend, Oliver, like he has, um, he's a, he's a porn director who's won a bunch of awards and he's kind of an interesting person where he's so young and he created a production company that actually employs a ton of people. And I'm always like, how did he do it? But it's almost like he just was like, you know, other people weren't giving me opportunities and I figured out how to make my own opportunity. And now it's like he employs other people. So Mm -hmm. it's like he knew he wanted something, but he wasn't so specific. Like I got to work for this, this company. Company. He yeah. just knew I want to do something. So he was like realistic, but also like fought for his dream. And so for me, I'm like, people can do it if they really want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And and even what you're saying, like, I guess I'm just like harping on balance a little bit, but like, but he had that balance of like, okay, I'm going to stay grounded in reality. But like, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be looking up at these clouds and being like, I can get there. There's a plane. A plane can get me there. A helicopter can get me there. Fucking uh, a launch thing can get me there. You know, like there are different, I mean, that's the same thing with intimacy coordinating. It's like, okay, this is the story we want to tell, but this actor doesn't want to be in this body position or they don't want this things shown or maybe like the network that won't allow this thing. So how are, what are all the different ways that we can tell the same story? Right. You just have to be flexible. You Mm. still have to know that you want something generally, but you do have to be flexible too. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but the people who are just like, I don't want to do it or other people stop me. It's like, man, it really stop you. You're letting them stop you. You let them stop you, you know. (laughs) You're accepting that stop. Yeah, Mm because you might not get it from them, but doesn't mean you can't get it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I I look at it that way. I'm always just kind of like, what am I doing or what can I change to fix things? Ooh, accountability. Yeah, accountability. (gasps) And it's really – because, I mean, when I was um, in my 20s and I remember always being mad, like no one's helping me, no (sighs) one's doing anything. And I remember like um, I think books have kind of saved my life because um, my brother-in-law was like, you need to read this book called – the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was all about personal accountability. And I was kind of just like, oh, okay, like it's me always reacting poorly. Mm-hmm. You know, like you can't control other people being crappy, but you can react because now it's like interesting because now when I go to meetings, it, no one says rude stuff like they did to me when I was younger, but I feel like if they did, I know how to snap back mm-hmm. a little quicker. Like I remember when I was like – um. Years and years ago, I had some sort of uh, one of those meetings for like those diversity programs. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote a script. They liked it. I got the meeting. And um, I was asking them a question of just like, oh, well, you guys like my script since you already have something kind of similar in development. And she's like, that's not us. And I was like, I was like, 
it was on a phone call. Mm. I was at the computer. I literally could see the deadline article in front of me. And I was just kind of like, oh, are you sure it's not? And she's like, no. And before you do a phone call, you should know who you're talking to. And she just didn't know her own company. She's yeah. kind of a bitch. But she was like, correct. And I, and I, instead of just telling her like, no, I'm looking at the article. You're, you know, mm-hmm. I just let it go. And then the way she talked to me after that was always like, you're so stupid. You came to this yeah. meeting. And I never corrected her. And I was kind of like, I should have just shut that down because this – and also is like a terrible person. Yeah. And then I went to like two more meetings with her, never got the fellowship. But like I just kind of wasted so much time and also kind of annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Ruby likes getting in front oh, of yeah. the camera. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's, it's like <sighs> – bullshitting the bullshitter. I guess you're not bullshitting though, but it's just like, especially in this town, there can be so many people that are just like high on their horse Mm -hmm. and full of shit. And it's like, I don't have time for that. I should have just said something because yeah. now it's like you can shut it down because really in my head at the time, I was like, I want her to like me so mm-hmm. bad that I'm going to just like eat it. And then she just like a factual thing. I just let her like steamroll me on. And looking back, I'm like, now I immediately know, oh, we're just not going to work out. So mm-hmm. I should have just told her and then just cut the meeting and then just leave. Like it's yeah. never – because she didn't give me a job either. Yeah. So I just ate it and wasted a bunch of time for like mm. nothing. So now my new thing is more like, okay, just be authentic and like don't be afraid to speak up and then see what happens. Have you had situations where something like that has happened and then you behave differently? Now? Mm-hmm. Now I feel like it just so naturally comes out that yeah. I'll say something that it just – and also though, saying something faster, it corrects things – so much quicker oh, yeah. too where I was like oh I could have actually saved myself so much like anxiety and thinking what could I have done better mm-hmm. I mean, just say it and then just whatever so now I just say things faster it's even like in a relationship it's yeah. like I'll immediately say it and the relationship will end faster versus we probably could have dragged it out a few more months but now I'm just like whatever for why like better but for why yeah. yeah it's life's short you know yeah yeah because you can you can identify those things faster and faster in relationships if you can take accountability for yourself and you can recognize the patterns that you are maybe entering into because most of these things are just patterns and we're just repeating patterns because we're like people pleasing and we want to see and we want to be hopeful and it's like well maybe you know like I want to empathize with this person I want to give them the benefit of the doubt blah 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 and it's like okay now it's three or four months in (laughs) and you were right and you knew it two weeks in or three weeks in and you chose to continue engaging in this situation being frustrated the whole time, probably Mm -hmm. having the same conversation every time, not really getting the fulfillment that you would want to get from a relationship, but you have those spikes of maybe good sex Mm -hmm. or spikes of feeling good and getting that dopamine hit when the person who's breadcrumbing you texts you back or finally makes a plan or whatever. But it's like, you didn't want that in the first place and that behavior hasn't changed. It's not going to get better. So it's, and and it's the same with business. Like mm-hmm. the people, how, how people treat you in that first meeting and how like the level of respect they give you in that first meeting is mm-hmm. how they will treat you through the entirety yes. of that relationship. And you know, what's an interesting thing is um, I was reading, I love to read. So there's another thing where it was um, about why people allow disrespect basically Ooh. is that um, if you're a secure person, um, when you're getting treated well, you continue to go there. But when you're treated bad, you you don't like it, you move on because you're mm-hmm. a secure person. But the people who grew up in environments of chaos where sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, they basically develop like a gambler's personality. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, oh, if you're with a person, one minute they're nice, but one minute they're a jerk, but you're like, maybe they'll be nice later. A secure person would never put up with it. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, even for me, I was like, oh my God, I used to thrive, not thrive, but uh, seek out these crazy, like, you know, like up and down places. And now I'm just like, no, secure all the way. That's it. That's all I want. It's like none of this, like, maybe they'll be nice later. Maybe it'll be okay. To me, I'm like, it'll never be okay. Just no, get away. Yeah. No. And that, again, is that dopamine hit. So it is – it's your hormones that are reacting in those moments when mm-hmm. we have that insecurity and when, um, you know, it's bad, 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 the good. And yes. then the good, those hormones give you enough energy to stick around when it gets bad and it's bad and it's bad and it's bad. And it's like, whoop, nope, now we have a good hit. Now that feels good and it feels extra good because it's extra exciting. And so when we're looking at relationships and we're not getting those dopamine hits and we're not getting that roller coaster of chaos of emotions, often people are like, oh, well, it's boring. Yes. It's not boring. You've just been trained that that's what a relationship is, but it's actually so incredibly unhelpful 
unhealthy for your nervous system, Mm. for your hormones, for your emotions, for your mental health. Like all of this is super unhealthy, but because film and television have taught us that like you meet someone and it's supposed to be this like, you know, all these big emotions and big feelings and stuff like that. And it's like, actually when it's something that's secure, you don't get any of that shit. Right. It's just stable. It's, yeah. And and that can feel boring. I get it. That's mm-hmm. that. You know, it can feel boring, but that's where you can have fun with your sex life. <laughs> <laughs> that's where novelty comes in. Um, yeah. It's it, the way that we've been conditioned is a lot. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Because at this point, I'm like, I'm glad actually to be older because now I'm just like, all I want is stability and peace. Mm-hmm. To me, I'm just like, okay, there's no peace. I don't even care anymore. I'm just like, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. I recently broke it off with someone who like, it wasn't even anything that was happening, but it was just kind of like, yo, dude, I'm not, this, this breadcrumb of inconsistent communication and what you're communicating within that is not working for me. So mm-hmm. if at some point you feel like you have the capacity to actually engage in a in co-creating a healthy friendship, lovership, relationship, whatever, we can maybe have a conversation again. But where you're at right now and how you behave in this moment is not for me. Yeah. And I think when I was younger, I would have dragged that out for months. Yeah. Um, for months and months. So this this does come with age and it comes from experience and it comes from security, but also just knowing that like Bread coming is bullshit. And like this, this mistreatment is like, what are we doing here? Why? Why are you wasting your energy? Your yeah. energy could be put towards your dreams. Yeah, because I have a theory now, because um I I I used to always date like either older men. Mm. Um, and then now I'm like trying to find someone more my own age because I feel like that's probably the better partnership. But the issue is is that like I'm just kind of like sometimes I'm with these guys my own age and like they're so they're at a place where I'm like, how are you at almost 40 not a man, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, you know what? You should be dating a 22-year-old because you don't think in a way that's mature, you know? It's like, yeah. why are you not an adult? But versus like the, when I was younger, I put up with so much crap that I'm like, maybe you should date these younger women who think this is fine. Like, yeah. We'll put up with it because I can see now why they don't want to date people their own age because I was like, we don't put up with it anymore. We're just like, yeah, I could just go hang out with my friends or I don't need yeah. your money. I don't need anything. It's like, what am, What are we here for? A hundred percent. Because when I, when I, in general, when I look at the men that I've like started to engage with and I'm like, nah, nah, like you're a mess. Uh, <laughs> and then I look at the other women that they're dating. I'm like, oh, they're all so much younger than you. Yes. And most of them have trauma. Oh, Yes. So yeah. like everyone, please go to therapy. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and listen, there are really beautiful, secure relationships that do have these massive age gaps. And so that's not what I'm talking about mm-hmm. because you can absolutely be in a healthy age gap relationship. Mm-hmm. But I think what you and I have experienced personally is, is echoing the, you know, unhealed cycles of aged gaps and mm-hmm. unhealed cycles of differences because you have younger women who just don't have a voice yet and and they haven't learned that you can speak up and you don't need to deal with this bullshit like that's the kind of stuff that comes from age i think women are learning younger you know hopefully we're talking about it enough <laughs> Hopefully us elders are know, giving them the like, goods. It was like, you know, just be independent. You'll be so much happier yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I I see – I just see a lot of men that are like hurt from relationships and then they just take that hurt and throw it into like sex and these other like young, 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 young girls that like are just so happy to have this older man. And these are the unhealthy dynamics that – we need to just cut out. We need to stop. And I'm, it's not passing judgment. These are – it's like unhealed people together. Mm-hmm. So it's like a collective healing and a collective yeah. accountability because if, if everyone was taking accountability for their actions, we wouldn't be seeing that. And I also <laughs> think it's like we're not even trying to judge as more just warn you. Of mm-hmm. Like this is what secretly happens. You yeah. know, it's like it's like that thing – I've dated so many men who turned out to be cheaters and they seemed really nice at first yeah. and they all end up being cheaters. Or um, I dated one guy who, who's kind of a scammer. And I was just like, it's just so scary what could happen, you know? And like, I remember um, I'm really good friends with my neighbors who are like um, 20 years older than me. Another one is like in her 80s. So she's like 40 years old. So they always gave me advice and they're just like, don't um, mix your finances and all this other stuff. And they just warned me and they're like, don't do that. They're like, we're not trying to say it in an anti-man way, but they're just like, 
don't fall for romance. This mm-hmm. is really about things like legal and money and stuff. Yeah. And then they hide it and like a lot of girls get manipulated. And mm-hmm. it's just weird because now because women work and they have their own money, you know, if you're dating these like loser scammers, it's like it hurts women sometimes, you know. Yeah. And there is a lot to be said about keeping your finances different in a relationship because when we look at the top problems in relationships, first of all, it's always communication. That's mm-hmm. that's always whatever whatever specifics it's around, communication is is the piece of it. Um, but it's sex and finance. Yeah. So those are the two areas that when you're in a relationship, if you want to like keep it good and and stable and healthy, keep your finances healthy. Keep your finances separate. Keep make sure that you always have an exit plan because I've been in that situation where like I just I mean it was a fine relationship, just not like it was like a sexless relationship and stuff like that and I wasn't happy and but because we were living together, it was so hard for me to get out of that, mm. that it was just like, okay, we'll just wait till the lease is up. And then you kind of fall back into a relationship and it's like, Ugh, what are we doing? Right. You know, like you fall into these cycles. Now, when you add abusive tendencies on top of that, mm-hmm. then there is no access to get away. Right. So even if you're just unhappy or it, worst cases is abusive, but like even if you're just unhappy, when your finances are mixed, it makes it so much harder to get out of that and to unravel yourself from that, even when you're married. By the way, sign a prenup. <laughs> yeah. But I think a lot of the time, like, um, there's kind of like a movement on TikTok that are trying to promote the traditional wife oh, lifestyle. Oh, yeah, the trad wife thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's also kind of funny when the fact that, like, the women who have been through it but who got discarded are just kind of warning these girls. Like, yeah. it's fun in the beginning. It seems like it. But then you kind of are stuck. Or if he gets yeah. discarded you and you're broke it's uh, and you have no skills you, it's a lot harder mm-hmm. and I think some people it's like we're so romanticized when you're young and I think that's why these older guys who like aren't mature they are going after sometimes these super young girls mm-hmm. who are just like so excited to get a nice meal and I know this because I was that girl when yeah. I was like 23 so I'm just more like warning you like please also keep your job <laughs> like don't yes. completely give them your power where you don't have like a resume and where mm-hmm. you can go somewhere else if something goes wrong because sometimes it will go wrong and if it goes right then guess what you are equally powerful, like you're even more powerful as a partnership. Yeah. So regardless of which way the relationship goes in the end, either you're going to come out on top because you were able to leave a situation that wasn't working for you and you were able to get a job and keep your money and get a new place and live on your own or live with a friend or whatever, Mm -hmm. or you're going to be in a situation with two pillars holding up a roof, yes. which is what you want in a relationship. Yes. And so, yeah. And and also with the, with the trad wife thing, they are not understanding that there was a time not that long ago, like when around the time that I was born, a little before I was born, I think, um, that women couldn't get credit cards. Mm-hmm. They couldn't get leases. They couldn't get cars. They could like literally – there was no legal way for a single woman to have her own bank account mm-hmm. or credit card or mortgage or rent or or lease or anything mm-hmm. like that's not good yeah. <laughs> that's a controlling situation and so this whole triad or trad thing um it leads to abuse mm-hmm. there's there's no way that it doesn't lead to abuse because then you have this one person controlling the other person and she has nowhere to go nothing to do she can't escape mm-hmm. legally now obviously thank god we can <laughs> we can get all the things but if you're giving that up especially if you're just like dating this person yes i don't get it even when they don't have the ring or like it's yeah. like at least you have some sort of legal protection if like things don't work out mm-hmm. but for them to like not work for like to be a stay at home girlfriend to me that's even crazier yeah. like don't be a stay at home girlfriend <laughs> yeah but i get it. i get the idea that it seems really fun to just do pilates every day and sure. seeming like you don't work but then what happens when he gets annoying or mm-hmm. he gets rude or something like that or you want to go on your own vacation you yeah. can't and all about him but i mean then in a way if you view that as your job then okay i guess that's it yeah, but there's no job security there. No, there's no job security. Terrible job. There's then, no 401k. And the next there's job no- is you just have to find a new trad boyfriend. And it's like, okay, I guess if that's yeah. your new – That could be their thing too. If that's what they're okay with. But then they have to realize too that that's what's 
kind of being set up. Yeah. And it just, again, puts you in a really vulnerable situation where, you know, if he, I mean, if you're, uh, most of these are monogamous, they're all, I think I can probably say they're all monogamous situations. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some non-monogamy in there. Um, but I'm very sure that there's non-consensual (laughs) non-monogamy. So, I'm pretty sure like 90% is that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, you know, it, yeah, it, there's there are a lot of problems there. And that's not even touching upon their like political views and stuff like that because mm-hmm. it's all tied to that. So very scary stuff, really, mm-hmm. like realistically speaking for for us as a society and for them as individuals. And I, I hope it's a phase that doesn't last long, but it probably will. Yeah. So speaking of all this, (laughs) you're from Kentucky? Kansas. Kansas. Okay. News with a K. It's with a K. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Okay. Um, So where in Kansas are you from? So I'm from this really small town called Coffeeville. So I grew up there and then I went to KU as undergrad. So I really love Kansas. Like I really miss it. But my family in the past uh, five years, they've all relocated to the Mm. Los Angeles area. So now I have less reason to go back. But I still have some friends in Kansas. But for the most part now, my family is like LA based. That's nice. Nice though. That's yeah. nice that you're all like, you don't have to go far. What do you remember from your sex education growing up? So I actually was surprised thinking about this is that um, um, I think that I missed the wave of abstinence only because mm-hmm. I actually got sex education. So when I was in elementary school, they um, divided up the boys and the girls and we all watched a different video. And I can't remember specifically what was in my video, but I just do remember there's one part where it was like, um, uh, boys grow this way, girls grow this way, and then eventually you'll make babies. But it wasn't like speci- like you know you didn't see too graphic or anything like that. But I just do remember they did tell us that mm-hmm. as in elementary school, and then when we got older. Um, there was a time in, in gym class. I think it was just one time, but then we did talk about it. And again, I think there was another video, but they um, they weren't even pushing abstinence only education at the time. So I was actually kind of shocked that they even t- talked to us about sex, like briefly. It was only like those videos, yeah. but that was it. I was still surprised they even did that. Yeah, it's still pretty impressive because it was – I honestly don't remember much at all from my sex education. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to find some people from my high school and be like, can you remind me? Like, what did we do? Yeah. (laughs) That's actually not a bad idea. I should do a whole episode of just people from my high school being like, please tell me what happened. (laughs) Yeah. But I remember even my town was like, not like we're like liberal by any means because the town was still like always voted red. I remember that. But um, we were more out – liberal in the fact that like there were different races in the town like there was a nearby town where like it was all white and Mm. then one time a black student tried to go and like the um kids bullied the kid so much he quit in one day like it was that racist that's terrible but the town that i was in was different where it's like there were different races there um different cultures uh, different religions and so they're more open to things Mm. and then like i remember even when people would get like pregnant in high school it's like they're like okay she's she's pregnant now like mm-hmm. you know there's like a little bit of shame but also kind of like man whatever we're all kind of like eh, yeah <laughs> like oh it happens did you have a lot of pregnancy in in high school yes a lot oh so interesting each year the class was pretty small like 130 total for each class and i think that like the year i graduated there was like because i'm counting the boy and the girl as okay a, yeah so there was still probably like i would say like 30 um it in my class. Wow. Of, yeah. So like 15, 15 couples. Babies. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a lot. It's a lot. And so, but we're all just kind of like, okay, whatever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> wow. And so that is really interesting because you see that mostly where you have abstinence only sex education. Do you remember any conversations around um, pregnancy and condom use or anything like that? Or do you like, do you think it happened and people were just like, whatever, we want to fuck? <laughs> I don't remember. If they taught us about condoms, and I don't remember how easy it was. Be- mm. Oh, okay. This is, I guess, how hard it was is that the town's really small. Everything you do, people know what you do. Mm. And so, like, let's say you wanted to buy condoms, they are just available at the Walmart. The problem is at Walmart, everyone works at Walmart. They'll yeah. see you there. So it's more like, are you brave enough to go buy them mm. at the thing? And I think that was the main thing. It's like no one was really stopping you except for the embarrassment of everyone knowing you're you just shame be, stopped yeah, you. Shame you, stopped yeah. you. Yeah. And there's no like Amazon that you can order it online or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So it's just more I think that was the thing. So yeah. no one was not naive enough to be like, um, you know, you won't get pregnant this way. But it's just more like they're just like, we're not going to go. Yeah. Let people know. 
Yeah. And there's also, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people also were not on birth control at the time, maybe in high school. They also, I don't ever remember learning about a fertility cycle until I was a health coach. And I didn't even learn it in my health coaching. It was just because I was digging more into like reproductive, you know, obviously as a sex educator, I'm like digging into this stuff. Mm. So it wasn't until I started on the whole coaching journey and holistic health and understanding all of that. That was the first time that I actually learned about fertility cycles and like when you can actually get pregnant and how your menstrual cycle actually oh. works and all the different hormones and all that stuff because you can really only get pregnant for about five days in your cycle, mm. give or take, because the sperm can live in the body for up to five days and you're ovulating for one. So the ovulation period is about a 24-hour window, but because the sperm can live in your body for up to five days, that's where the window gets extended. Oh, okay. But if you don't know that, then – First of all, I think you just kind of assume that you can get pregnant all the time, mm -hmm. which is like you can't. Um, but also you don't know when you can get pregnant. Mm. And so it's it, it kind of bo works both ways. But I never knew that growing up and no. most people don't. They taught us about periods and things like that. I remember that. I didn't remember that in middle school. Like the gym teacher actually showed us like pads mm -hmm. and tampons and stuff like that. So that part was pretty cool. But um, they might have even said more but like wasn't paying that much attention. But I think that there were teachers who really were trying. Um, so that was cool. That, yeah. that part was cool and yeah. surprising for Kansas. For sure. <laughs> yeah. And then what was the experience for you like as you transitioned in like your writing into more sexual stuff? And because the erotica came first or Hustler? Erotica came first. Okay. Um, I wrote that and um, let's see. I think at the time like on the internet people would like um, – send me like messages. They like, uh, it was mostly like dudes who wanted mm. to like talk to me and stuff, but they're all nice about it and stuff like that. And I didn't think anything was like too odd. And then I think that like when I started writing for Hustler and then, um, I, th I don't know if social media got where it's like you got even more access to people mm. or what, but it also could be because stand up they got more access to yeah. people. So then like people just started to like talk to me more and more about stuff. But like, um, uh, yeah, I don't know if it was like because they have access to me in person or if it was the internet. But Yeah. And so when you – like did you have any – fears or rev reservations because with with people who work in sexuality I always say and like often we talk about like the whole coming out because there is a little bit of like a coming out as a person who works in sexuality mm -hmm. or writes about or has a show on or like mm -hmm. whatever um do you feel like you had any sort of coming out for yourself or did you ever use a pen oh. name or anything like that? Oh, a good question. So when I wrote the books, um, I used my real name and I didn't even think anything of it. And if people were being weird about it, I didn't even think of it because I just thought to myself, they're books. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to Hustler, I actually um, also used my real name, but I didn't um, think of it as pornography. It, it's so stupid, but I, I just thought of myself as a journalist. So I didn't yeah. even care. But then what happened is um, when I first started work or writing for them is um, I would write news articles for their website. And the website was under a pay um, a paywall. Mm. And then when I started to do, um, they started asking me to do more stuff. I started writing for the magazine and things like that. And then I really started to hit me like, oh, I do work in the adult industry. Yeah. And then I actually started getting kind of nervous. So I stopped telling people. And then um, when I started doing stand-up, I started doing stand-up in uh, 2018. And um, I would kind of tell people I'm a writer, but I didn't, I was vague. And it got to the point where like I got feedback from someone. They're like, you need to just be open because when you just are vague, it actually makes people was like, why is she not sharing mm. this? Um, so why don't you just share it? And so then I started saying like, oh, I write for Hustler. And then most people would cheer. They thought it was exciting. So I was like, oh, okay, I should be more open. So I started being more open. And then um, I did a show um, in a conservative area and I didn't realize that they would be so grossed out by it. Yeah. They literally were just like, ugh. And then like just tuned me out and then like I bombed. It was really bad. And um, – but that's when I was like, oh, now I'm remembering why I used to hide and stuff. So then I got kind of nervous about it. And then at, the more I did stand-up, I was like, okay – you have to just 100% be okay with it if they don't like it. And I had to kind of build that muscle of being like, I'm going to be fine with this. But there was periods where I didn't tell people, I told people, I got nervous, um, and now I'm just telling everybody. So yeah. it's, it was a bit of a roller coaster. It's a journey. I yeah. mean, especially when you're working for Hustler specifically because it has so much – 
negative connotation. Like, I don't want to say negative connotation, but like for people who are uh, more like purity culture or conservative or fearful of sex or shameful or like any of those things, I think when you hear hustler, even versus playboy, no, it has a different connotation. That is 100% real. So for instance, like playboy, people work for playboy or if you even pose for playboy and stuff, I don't think people view it as porn. No. But everybody views Hustler as like hardcore porn. And I mean, granted, Hustler does make hardcore porn. But like at the same time, Playboy had those parties. Playboy, they're still showing like close enough to like solo Mm -hmm. type of things or girl on girl things. But people still don't view that as porn. And so it was kind of an interesting thing of just being like, why do you guys think it as one? But at the same time, you just have to accept like that's how people view it. That's the branding and you just accept it. Yeah. It's an exercise in marketing because Hugh Hefner tried so hard to make it like this classy thing. And that's where the articles came in. And that's Mm -hmm. where, you know, it was like they were so strict on what the bunnies could wear and what their sets looked like and all this stuff because they really wanted it to be something that was different than pornography, even though it was and is pornography. Pornography. Right? But it's so it, it reminds me of so much of um OnlyFans versus Patreon. So yes. I used to have a, a Patreon and then um I started off for my writing and then it just my only subscribers were men and they would be like, Can you post pictures? So I post like modeling pictures, and that's the only reason they started paying. And so it was a very close to an OnlyFans without any nudity. And yeah. then they're like, Are you gonna show nudity? And I was like, I don't know, I don't know. But at the same time, I was like, I started the Patreon because I was like, Oh, I don't want to look like I have a porno type yeah. of thing. And then um, the guys basically turned it into an OnlyFans, but I was on Patreon, so I like like to pretend that I wasn't at that level yet. Mm-hmm. Finally, one day, like my friend was just like, just start an OnlyFans. So I just canceled the Patreon, eventually moved over to OnlyFans, made so much more money. And I was kind of like, why do I even care about the, the brand? What's the – it was so – close to being the same thing and then I just when I finally was just like who cares Mm -hmm. and then I just made way more money and then now that's how that's how I view everything now it's just like you're so close anyway (laughs) yeah like what are we doing here I actually also just started an OnlyFans Mm. I have to I have to actually like load it with stuff but as we were talking about pole dancing before we got on here and so It was kind of one of those things. Really, it came for me because I started doing shibari self ties, but like (gasps) in a really beautiful aesthetic way. And I would do it. I I not would I do do it with like rhinestones. So I'll wear rhinestone pasties because I think the thing with shibari is the human form. I really love art that uses the human form. I think the mm. I think human bodies are beautiful. I think the ways that we can shape them are beautiful. All different shapes are beautiful and that human bodies deserve to be celebrated. So for me with Shibari, I'm like, I don't want to wear bodysuits. I don't want to wear tank tops. I don't want to wear those things because part of the art is your actual body. Mm. But I was like, but I want to do it like a showgirl. And so then I was like, okay, well, I don't want this to be on Instagram and it shouldn't be. It's my art. And like, I'm having to learn these ties and like contort my body in different ways and like really create art here. And I have all this pole dancing. I have all this stuff. And I'm like, why am I not getting paid for my art? That's ridiculous. And I think that's another barrier to all this stuff. It's like the yeah. se- Patreon versus OnlyFans. Like it's still it's still your content and still your creativity. And then like artists giving away their art versus getting paid for their art. It's like all of those oh things rolled into one. And it's so interesting because I used to not grasp the concept of like why would people pay when it's free? Like even with porn before I entered the, the porn industry. And it's like people do pay. And people who pay are so much more respectful than people who accept expect it for free. Yes. And even like when it comes to art, it's like one thing to give like a free advertisement like one, but to, it, them to expect the whole thing. Yeah. Right? And it's like, no, people will pay for it. People will always pay. People go to a museum to pay. Mm-hmm. People buy a magazine. People pay for cable. You can get people to pay. And it's like the people who won't pay, you don't want them as whatever. They're Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and I think it's also a conversation around how we value art in yes. general mm-hmm. and how we value erotic art and how we value sexuality. Yeah. All of those things are connected and none of those things should be free. I find it so fascinating. Like I want to Maybe because of when I was in my 20s, I was pursuing screenwriting. And I just felt like I was giving everything for free. No one was paying me. People took advantage of me so much. Like um, I remember that I um, optioned a script for a year and the guy didn't even pay me. And then he would constantly write me, be like, you need to update this. This is 
actually treated me like I was like his servant or something, Ugh. but no payment. And I gave away the rights for one year. I was like, I'm so stupid. But w- once I entered the adult industry, I met so many sex workers and they're so empowered. They knew business, they knew money, and they're also so kind. Mm-hmm. And so like they just completely changed my worldview. And they were just kind of like, no, if someone even wants to talk to me, they need to pay $20. I was like, Wow. Yeah, I was like, yeah, ah, it's mind blowing. And then you're like, and here I am dealing with these dumbass motherfuckers in my DMs. Like, yeah, what? No, it's no, so that funny. is your time. It's your yes. time. It's your energy. Right. Back to what we were saying of like, if you really want to go for something, you have to go for it. Well, that requires focus and energy. Yes. And if you're giving your focus and energy to people that are just sliding in your DMs or some free project that you're getting like requests for revisions, 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 but you're not getting paid for anything Mm -hmm. or you're in a relationship with someone who's breadcrumbing you Mm -hmm. or being avoidant or whatever, that is you making an active decision to focus on those things that are not moving you forward versus the stuff that will move you forward. Yeah. I remember I used to get like the most annoying DMs and um, I wouldn't respond to them, but I did read them and I'd be kind of annoyed. Like, Mm -hmm. why are you talking like this? And I used to get annoyed. And then I talked to this um, porn star and the porn star was basically like, you know, when I get messages like this, I'm like, you can send me $5 and I'll respond and talk to you one time. And then some of the guys would. And then I was like, wait. And then she's like, yeah, I never get mad. I just immediately ask for the money. And if they give it, then I talk. And I'm like, oh. And then when I started thinking about that, that's when I started to stop getting mad. Mm -hmm. Even when it's like the OnlyFans, for instance, like people can talk to me whatever they want because they paid to be there. Yeah. But on Instagram, no No. one can talk to me. (laughs) Yeah. You're not getting any of that for free. And then you're not mad when when it's monetized. I don't know how to describe it, but I'm just no longer mad. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you, it comes back to security, right? Like yeah. sexy security. That's what's up. Like when you are secure in what you have, what you offer, what you're doing, who you are, what you want, it changes everything for you because yes. then you can stand in your power and say, pay me five bucks. If you don't, okay. Yeah. What the hell do I care? I'm not going to waste my time. Right. <laughs> Either and- I will give you my time because right? you value my time or you can fuck up. And some women are so nervous where they're like, oh, I don't want to be called like a slut or like a whore. And I'm like, they're going to call you that no matter what. You might as well get the $100, you know? Like, it's just crazy. It's like they'll treat you bad no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. So you might as well live your best life. Yeah. And the person who is going to pay – Will not talk is to you. Is not like going to speak to you like That's that because crazy. they respect you enough to pay you. And so, so true. you it's can just find those differences. Like, if they're going to slut shame you or call you names or anything like that. That's not the person that's going to pay you anyway. So like, right? what do you even want to be engaging yes. or or be tailoring your your art or your gifts or whatever service it is that you're offering? Mm-hmm. Why would you want to tailor it for that person that's not going to pay for whatever that service or experience is? Yeah. My sister had a good saying about that where I was always like, oh, I don't want to do this because some creepy person will do this to me. And she was always like, they're going to be creepy no matter what. You yeah. might as well be making money and you might as well be happy, you mm-hmm. know? And I was like, like I liked her point of view. Yeah, yeah. Like we are catering to basically these trashy people. Why? Like we don't have to do that. Like yeah. they can't control us. Don't yeah. let them control us and they don't even give you anything. Yeah. You get to show up in the world in a way that makes you feel good. Mm-hmm. And I think that even comes back to everything that you were saying earlier, even just with like stand up and just being okay with people not being okay with you. Mm-hmm. That is such a powerful, powerful lesson yeah. as an artist, as a freelancer, as a woman in mm-hmm. the world is like, not everyone's going to like you. And yeah. that's okay. And that's okay. And also, they don't have to. People who can smell desperation are like, you know, they're like these predators, but they can tell who's easier to prey or whatever. Like yeah. I remember in stand up, like the first two years I was doing it, creepy people would be like, do this show, but you have to bring all these people or, and then, or like, you know, they'd ask me on like dates and just be mm. creepy or they say creepy stuff. And then I was just like, I'm going to leave. Like I remember one time I was all the way down in Orange County and like this dude, he was the owner of the club and he was just creepy with me. And I was like, I'm going to leave. And I just left and I never went back. And I yeah. was kind of like, he probably probably expected people to be like, oh, but I really want spots. And I'm like, we don't need 
to do this anymore. But I also think, though, if I was younger, back when I was a wannabe screenwriter, I didn't let people treat me like crap. And mm-hmm. I almost view stand-up um, as my act two mm-hmm. of like, oh, I learned in act one. You can't treat me. I'm a different person now. And I also – I. I credit like um, the adult industry and all the sex workers I've met because they did make me a way stronger person than anyone in Hollywood ever did. Oh my God. Yes. Because sex workers know their boundaries and they stick to those boundaries in a way that, yes, Yes. they know their value. They know their worth. They know their boundaries. They are not afraid to walk away. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to say that sex workers early in their careers don't True. do the same thing that all of us do because we're all humans and yeah. it's like human nature to go through that, especially mm-hmm. as women. We're people pleasers. We're taught not to raise a ruckus, not to make a mess, you know, to keep yourself safe, to just be like the cool girl, like uh, all of these layers and layers and layers of messages. So not saying that sex workers don't go through that too, yes. but I think to our earlier point of like going through these cycles faster, I think they learn faster because they have so many mentors around them. Yes. Like girls working in clubs, you can either be in a club that like all the women there are shitty and it's Mm. like a really bad situation. I know so many friends that have been in those situations, but I also know a lot of women that worked in clubs where it was like, such a sisterhood vibe and like they will take care of the little ones. Like they will teach the young ones like this is the kind of person you stay away from. This is what you accept. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. Like they will not hesitate to kick somebody out of a club. Like, you know, we, we need, I mean, this is why female friendships and like, yeah. you know, like we need our elder, we need our elders. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. You need someone to take care of you for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. 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 Baby girl. <laughs> you need a mommy or a daddy or whoever. Everyone needs that. I yeah. think that's really true. Yeah. Everyone needs a mommy. <laughs> yeah. There's like, there's like a thing about, um, society was kind of deviating from, I think they thought dependence was bad and, mm. but they didn't talk about how it's good to be a whole person and come together with other people. And that's called interdependence. Yeah. And nobody talks about like, we as a society should not be by ourselves. We need people to help us. We need mentors. We need friends. We need people of all levels around us, but we're taught too much to be solo and solo is mm-hmm. also not good. You're yeah. going to be in danger or just live on this Island and do nothing, you know? Yeah. So it's like, we do need people for sure. Sure. And yeah. good people, though. It, it, when you're around a bunch of bad people, it's like you're by yourself. It's point. bad. Yeah, yeah. That's that's not good. But yeah, it's the it's the village vibe. It's yes. like let's all we all have different skills. We all have different perspectives. We have different experiences, and we need all of those things for everyone to to thrive. A rising what is it? A rising tide sails all. No. A rising, it's like something with, oh, a rising tide lifts all shifts. Oh, okay. Something like that. Okay. But the idea is that, you know, like a ri- if, if the tide is rising, every ship there is going up. So oh, as opposed to like yeah. competitiveness and working in silos and being solo, when we can work together and when we can be in the ocean together, mm-hmm. we're all going to go up together. Like if we can support right. each other, then we all go up. That's how societies change. That's how culture changes mm-hmm. is by all of us together being like, we're not going to do that anymore. Right. Look at Me Too. Me Too is a, a great example of that where enough survivors came forward. Mm-hmm. They felt empowered by other survivors. They came together as a group and everyone was like, yeah, Me Too. And now intimacy coordinators on er- are on almost every set. Yeah. Soon, it, soon it's going to be required, I'm sure. But right now, I don't think that there are enough skilled people in everywhere that, that unions are shooting to require it. Oh. But I'm sure it will be at some point. Mm -hmm. So that's just such an example of like everybody coming together with their different experiences and perspectives and voices has literally shifted the culture and and the dynamic of an industry and what we will take and what we will not take. Mm -hmm. So speak up. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Exactly. And get friends. Yeah, (laughs) get friends. Get friends. Don't be alone. Yeah, exactly. Let me see a little time check here. I forgot to set up my board clock. Oh, good. Oh, look at that time. It is the right time. Okay. So usually for my um, comedians on the show, I'll do a pop quiz. But for the sex experts, I will have them share something. Okay. So I think uh, you are in the sex expert world. Okay. And I think it's more fun for you to share something okay, that you sure. wish people knew more about, either about sex and sexuality or um, just in general. I mean, that's kind of – I feel like this is, whole conversation has been like that. Mm. Um, but what do you – what do you feel like, like, what do you, what would you leave people with in terms of like sex 
sex and sexuality? I would say that people – not all people, but many people are very dishonest about sexuality where they they can't be open with what they really want. And I think that once you get to the point where you figure out what you really want, it's okay to just be blatantly open so that you don't waste your time. Like I remember um, I was talking to this guy on a Tinder at one point and we went on like a Zoom date and it was actually really fun. But at the very end, he's like, okay, I got to be honest with you because I don't want to waste our time. I'm really into this kink. And he got really specific and he's like, can you do that or would you be cool with it? And I was kind of like, no. And then there's the end because he didn't want to waste time, right? And to me, I was also like, great because – like you're not going to get what you want if you're not honest. And I think the thing about with sexuality is some people are afraid to even negotiate, like to mm. even say up front, like these are what I want. This is what I'm cool with. This is what I don't like to do. This is what I like to do. They can't tell people. They don't – they feel almost like that's like a – almost like a businessy thing. But mm. sometimes it's like – like kind of at a certain point, the older you get, everything is business. Everything is you have to like just be upfront. You have to, you know, but a lot of people haven't reached that point yet. But I think that if they do, they will be so much happier. Yeah, I love that so much. And yeah, talking about sex is really, really difficult. Yes. It's it. There's so much shame involved. There's the guilt because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You don't want to be shamed. What if you get rejected? What if somebody yucks your yum? Yeah. Like there, you know, like there's so many layers to that. I actually have um, two tools for that. I have a yes, no, maybe list that people can get. Oh. Um, just go to birdsandbeesdon'tfuck.com. So I have a yes, no, maybe list with like a little accompanying class that people can watch. Oh, that's cool. all free. And then um, I also just created a, a circle of sex, which is really similar to a wheel of life that I used to mm. use in my health coaching. That has eight different slices of your sexual world. Oh, and wow. so you can kind of gauge where you're at on that. So one of them is a communication tool. And the other one is just kind of like, well, where am I? Do I have a full circle mm -hmm. here? Like, am I really feeling fulfilled in all these areas? Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of couple that with the yes, no, maybe list to be like, okay, well, if I'm not feeling like the novelty is there, let me look at my little yes, no, maybe list. What are the things that I want to do that maybe I haven't been doing lately? And then all of a sudden your sense of novelty is up or, you know, your education is low on the wheel. And then you can look into like, oh, well, I do want to try Shibari, for example. Mm -hmm. So let me go learn a little bit about that. Now you're pumping your education up a little bit. So it's like, it is so hard for us to talk about these things. Yeah. And that's where that dishonesty comes from. Right. So like, I really want to help people have those conversations because of everything you just said. And it makes sense of why also they feel like they have to hide because mm -hmm. I even look at something on like, let's say Instagram, like I'll see this girl post a video being like, I want a guy to pay for all my dates. And to me, that's what I like too. But when she posts that she gets all this hate, the dudes are like, you, you know, you're anti-feminist or, you know, yeah. you're too ugly to ask people. It's like crazy stuff. But it's it's like it makes sense because people who don't match you will really shame you or mm -hmm. it's like, do you want to change you or you just want to shame them? I don't really understand their motivation. But no matter what, I can see why people are afraid because people get so angry sometimes when you like have something that you want that they can't give you. They get crazy. Oh, yeah. And the reality is there are so many men out there that want to treat a woman, that want to be in that dynamic, yes. that want to be daddy, that want to be a, a master. Like if we're going to talk about <laughs> yeah, Dom yes, Sub, like uh -huh. that is their kink. Their desire is to fully worship this woman, to take care of her, to do all the things for her, not in a trad way, mm -hmm. but in a way that feels good and reciprocal for both parties because she wants to be taken care of and he wants to care for her great. Yes. This is a beautiful thing because we're all on the same page, but you can't get there if you don't have that conversation. Right. Yeah. I sense. love that. Yeah. yeah. So where can people find you? Um, I am on OnlyFans at Tilo Club and I'm on Instagram at Teresa Low Writer. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was such a fun conversation. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Yeah. I feel like there were so many – I could talk to you forever because I feel like there were so many avenues, especially like looking through your work that I'm like, oh, we could talk about this. We could talk <laughs> about this, which is like – Kind of the fun part about this show is like I never know what we're going to wind up talking about. Yeah, so. that's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you like this show, then please uh, like. Make sure that you're subscribed on YouTube. I'm really going to be pushing the YouTube for this now. Uh, 
because the whole point of this was always to be video and, and to be a web series versus a podcast. So uh, listen to podcasts if you're in the car or something, but um, subscribe on YouTube, like it on YouTube, share, comment, subscribe. I don't know how YouTube works, but like hit us up there. Hopefully you're watching this now. So forward this to a friend. Um, you can go to birdsandbeesdon'tfuck.com. You can get the yes, no, maybe list and the circle of sex. Uh, my OnlyFans that I started is OnlyFans.com slash Shabari Showgirl. So if you would like to see some erotic art, that is, I like how you do on yours 18 plus non, uh, non explicit. Yeah, yeah. non explicit, because that's my vibe too. Yeah. Um, you're not going to see my titties, but you will see some beautiful art. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for coming. Bye. Bye.